Greg, the power bill's here. Oh, thanks. Well, that's not too bad. <laughs> Put your head up, man. We're trying to film. <laughs> Welcome to the second part of our solar series. This part is more detailed towards the numbers and maybe the power geeks that uh, would find some information about this. Mind you, I have not been able to find anywhere before we did this install 550 feet away I couldn't find anywhere anyone on the internet who had experience doing what we have done and it's worked really well for us as you'll see in this video and I am happy to share it because this was information I could not find on the internet Thanks for watching and subscribe to our channel. Next step is to get these panels up on the support beams so they don't get blown over. This connection is from the panels that are run in series. This connection goes to here, 10 gauge to one gauge. This is temporary. I've got a combination box and a, amp and a fuse for that. So this is my negative line. Of course, it's gonna be in a combiner box as well. But if all of this line that is going all the way up the mountain here, I spent $500 on. Uh, which is a pretty damn good deal for a whole bunch of one gauge aluminum RW90 wire. As you can see, it's a quite a long ways to go. We are, are gonna have this in conduit soon enough. Uh, we just don't have the money to buy 550 feet of conduit right now. So this is where my one gauge meets my four gauge wire. It's copper and aluminum. So I have it in a terminal lugs that are just cinched together with a bolt and in that little waterproof area. And then it goes underneath the ground all the way up. So this right here is where I had to link two lines together. I used a lug connector with double wall heat shrink and then I put a bunch of uh, electrical tape over that and kept it out of the ground for now. So the rest of the wire goes underneath the ground, just underneath the ground, all the way along the fence here. It goes into the bus right here. This is four gauge copper wire that I had left over from a different project. So yeah, it comes out right here, goes up and makes a connection there, which is another soldered like mega connection. It's basically the same wire and it goes into the top of the bus right there. So this is our generator. This is what gets us through the winter. It's a 3600 watt 
Um, it's a 3600 watt electric start generator. And Katie, hold that bob up. That is how we start it. Katie, that's really handy. remote control start that is a game changer and we take care of this thing because one thing we've learned about living off grid is generators need maintenance okay so from that plug right here is from the uh, the generator comes into a power max 12 volt 75 amp um, charger and that is what I need to charge the battery bank that's under here that I'll show you in a moment so when we don't use our, so our solar power this is what we use and we are going to be changing all this up because we are going to be running a 24 volt system uh, soon because it's much more efficient and it'll give us a lot more usable power really um, so we have two inverters right now. One is not being used. This is a modified sine wave, and this is a borrowed inverter from a friend. This is a pure sine wave inverter. And because of the pandemic and Katie having to work from home, she's got her work computer here and it needs to run on a pure sine wave inverter. That means we're running a thousand watts of power in the house, in the house, in the bus. Um, and that is a bit of a pain in the butt. So we, like, we can run the computer and we can run the uh, water pump that, that pump, uh, pressurizes our, our plumbing uh, and that is it if we plug in two cell phones and uh and turn on well i guess we don't have any ac lights in here but if we plug anything else in it chips the breaker and it's just too much so that's a lot of power being used on a continuous basis her big computer she's got two screens and a giant computer and it actually pulls quite a bit of power so we're temporarily using this the 2000 watt was okay I'm definitely buying a 4,000 watt 24 volt inverter because we're going to hardwire it into our house. Well, hardwire, yeah. We're gonna have it, we're gonna use it in the house and it, it'll make it a lot easier for us to uh, have power without limitations. Mind you, what do we really use our power for? Like pl plugging in a cell phone, watching a we, TV. We run a washer on it. Yeah, we wanna run a washer on it, but um, hopefully someday we'll be able to run a dryer as well. And that'll be a whole different whole different video. Anyway, so moving over here, this is my charge controller. This is a Flexmax, uh, sorry, Outback Flexmax FM80. And this takes, so right now we're pulling 90 volts and 6.2 amps. And the output from this is 15 volts and 32 amps charging from a, a kind of, not a super sunny day, it's kind of cloudy. So. We're getting 420 watts right now. That's not really, it's not great, but it's not bad. For, for the size of our system and the size of our battery bank, it's, it's totally fine for us. This is my solar cutoff. So this is where my solar panels come in. I have a 30 amp breaker right there, which shouldn't be a 30 amp breaker. This should be a 15 amp breaker, but I'm gonna leave this as is because this 15 amp breaker is what I'm gonna have installed down by the panels so that I can isolate the panels, which I can't do right now because I have a, I have a, uh, what do they call it? A uh, combiner box that I'm gonna install down there, but it's on order and Amazon's going pretty slow these days. So I got a couple things that I'm waiting for to, to show up and that'll make it a lot safer because if I had to isolate those panels, I would have to go down and actually unplug a panel or I can isolate them up here, which is no good because I have 550 feet of line coming up here. So this is important and I'm waiting, I'm eagerly waiting to install this. Um, so yeah, we've got the 80 amp charge controller. This thing's great. I can throw a whole bunch of power into this thing. It's, it, it's I'll have to look into the, the specs to see what the maximum open circuit voltage is. So yeah, this is our power shed. And I will in a second show you what's in, what we have for batteries here. So these are our batteries. These are four Surrett S550 six volt batteries. Um, I have them configured in a 12 volt configuration. 
Um, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna be changing this to a 24 volt configuration, and we're gonna use these batteries probably for another year, and then we're gonna be doing a full overhaul with lithium. Flooded less lead acid works, but it's not perfect. There's a lot of, you know, there's a bit of work that goes into uh, keeping them maintained, and honestly, lithium is just the way to go. So we have a ventilation system in here. It doesn't really look like it, but our composting toilet is on the other side of this wall. And we run a fan from the composting toilet outside. Um, and that fan runs 100% of the time. And we have holes, ventilation holes in this box that pull air out through that fan as well. And then we have a very small hole in the top that allows air to come in so that all of that air is being continuously pulled out. And even when we're doing an equalization charge, which anyone who is off grid and that uses these deep cycle would knows that the equalization charge stinks uh, because of the gases coming out. So even when we're doing an equalization charge, uh, all of that smell is contained inside here and actually goes outside. And you can actually smell it outside when we're doing an equalization charge. So we've got it pretty well vented. And that was kind of a, uh, just a by accident. I was trying to figure out how to vent this, but um, I just realized a few holes in the wall, I have a fan constantly pulling air out. That's the perfect scenario. So. This is good for now, but yeah, we're uh, we're realizing that we have 428 usable amp hours, which is half of our actual capacity with our, on our 12 volt system. But because it's a lead acid battery, you only use 50% of your state of charge. So, um, 428 amp hours, yeah, it's doable, but. In the future, I want to at least double or triple that. We're going to see how it goes when we have everything running in a 24 volt configuration, but I'm pretty sure that in the future, we're going to invest in having uh, a much larger battery bank. But for what we need and what we do, we've never had issues. We've never had any serious issues with power. The only issues we've had with power are uh, just us being not knowing what we're doing. So it's been a, it's been a pretty steep learning curve, but we're, we're figuring it out. This whole bus has been a steep learning curve and it's nice that, nice that we're making the mistakes here so that when we when we have a house, um, we, we've already learned the lessons. And then I've got two more things to point out. So I got this right here. This is a battery monitor that I got off Amazon uh, for 50 bucks. If you want a cheap way to see what's going on with your battery bank, this battery monitor is amazing. Um, for the price, you just it just can't be beat. It's 50 bucks. Um, you just plug it in. This is our 12 volt block. We all of our lights run on 12 volt, um, and we had a fridge on here in 12 volt, and we had a pump in here on 12 volt. But anyway, so this uh, you just plug it into your you know plug it into the battery, and then it has a Bluetooth um, capability that you can see what, what like a graph of the state of charge on your phone. So this is the app that we use for the battery monitor. And as you can see, it's giving us a full readout live right now of what's happening. So we're at 14.8 volts, and that's because we're charging right now. And we're doing what's called a bulk charge. And I'll show you here. Yeah, you can see that this, this is our sunlight that is not uh, consistent. We have clouds. You can, it's, you can easily see. Let's see when the last time. There we go. So this is clouds like those little dips in that line but what happens is we start with a bulk charge and then we do a float charge which is a lower voltage to keep the batteries to get the last little bit of the batteries full this is a really great tool because you can go back and take a look at the state of charge that was a beautiful sunny day as you can see there's no interruptions there um, and i've been running my work computer and it's it's been and it's it pulls quite a bit of power for a computer like it's huge that's a cloudy day that's a very sunny day like that's incredible anyway and the nice thing is our our lowest state of charge is about 12 4 7 so we're like we're not even going yeah 12 4 1 this is in the morning yeah we're 12, yeah, more or less 12.5 right there. So why don't you explain what the 12.5 is? <sighs> well, okay, so this for the state of charge, it would be easier to show a picture. I, I will put up, put up a picture just to show you what the state of charge of a uh, 
a flood lead acid battery in a 12 volt configuration looks like. Um, with those numbers, the, the, the rule of thumb with a flooded lead acid battery is to never let your batteries go into the 11 volt range. You want to always keep it, we don't let our batteries go into, into the 12 2 range because it's the less you use of your batteries, the healthier your batteries remain. Um, if you're taking them down to 30% and 30%, your batteries are not, like flooded lead acid batteries, the, these deep cycle batteries, they're not meant for that kind of abuse. Um, lead, I mean lithium on the other hand, you can you can just almost fully discharge lithium for 5,000 cycles and, and it still uh, runs like a brand new battery. So even though it's a much more expensive uh, battery, we're going to be switching over because it will, you know, for probably four or five grand, we're going to have the last power um, container that we're ever going to need. Like our batteries are going to last us five to eight thousand cycles, and uh, we do a cycle a day pretty much. So think of how long that is in a, you know, in the span of how many years would that be, Katie? I can't do the math off my head. Anyway, it's the way to go. We have these at lead acid; they work fine. But in the future, it's going to be lithium. So this one gauge cable is aluminum. Uh, like I said, I got it for a really good price. And this here is copper. This is four gauge copper. So I'm gonna show you the line losses for, this will be about, we're gonna say about 500 feet of this one gauge. This one gauge aluminum RW, 90 wire has a voltage drop of 1.44% over 500 feet because I have about 500 feet of it and then my other 500, or sorry, my other 50 feet are copper and I'll show that in a moment. But what I want to point out is the voltage that I'm running when I combine those three panels, when I combine the open circuit voltage is 116.8 because I'm running it in series, you, you add the uh, open circuit voltage. If I was running it in parallel, you would add the amps. And then I'll show you the line losses for about 50 feet of this alum, I'm sorry, of these, uh, this copper. This is the four gauge copper wire. Everything's the same, same voltage, same load current, only running 50 feet from that little red junction box to the bus. The voltage drop percentage is 0 0.092, which is incredible. Both of these are RW90. Um, I bought black wire, so I just put a little paint on it, and I actually messed up. I had to put white for black and red for red. Anyway, I know what I'm doing here. This is a question for you if you are a solar expert watching this video. So if, as you can see right here, 6.67 kilowatts, so 670 watts. How the heck... So, six, so 860, that's higher than what my, my panels can pull in. 825 is, is the combined wattage of them. So I've got 860. Check this out. 900 watts. Okay, 900 watts from 550 feet away with maximum 2% line loss. How the heck am I pulling better than optimal efficiency for my panels? Leave comments in below and let me know because I have no clue. Is it something to do with the MPPT charge controller? Is it something to do with a weird uh, event in nature where we just have a huge solar flare and the, like, I have no clue. Anyway, please let me know and uh, put this mystery to an end. Thanks.